Greetings and welcome back to the second mini lecture on Locke. And when I left you, I was in the state of nature and I want you to write this down because I think it's an important point somewhere in your notes. And that is the primary reason that I group Hobbes and Locke together is that they both make the assumption that if government did not exist, our deficiencies as people would be magnified without government. We can't change who we are as people, and here I'm stealing from the Federalists who were heavily influenced by both Hobbes and Locke. So since we can't change who we are as people, the best we can hope to do is to control the effects of our human nature by building a government that works with our human nature and not against it. So uh, Hobbes and Locke both make the assumption that people are better off with government than without it. So that's the first important point. And, and, and the second, and I think equally important point, is that these people are concerned as social contract theorists, and this is one of the definitions in your book, so I'm stealing from your textbook here, right? As social contract theorists are really interested in the conditions why government is created in the first place, and I already answered that by saying, governments are created uh, in this case because people rationally understand that we're better off with government than without it. So uh, that was going to actually be in the last mini lecture and I did not budget my time very well. So uh, I had to start this one by finishing up the last one. So I'm to number four in your notes. And uh, in your notes, uh, uh, Locke is talking about, you know, what is human nature like? If government did not exist, the state of nature, what would people be like? Remember, for Hobbes, they were selfish, they were potentially evil, warlike, their evil impulses would overwhelm their, their rationality. Locke doesn't buy that. Locke has a much more benevolent uh, view of human nature. He believes that people are basically good in the state of nature, but it's primitive. There's no code of law. There are no judges to adjudicate dispute, disputes. There obviously would be no uh, code of law. So therefore, there would be no enforcement of the law. Uh, as I said in the last mini lecture, life without government, the state of nature would be primitive. People would be free. They would be autonomous. But they would have a desire for private property and government would not be there to protect the private property rights of individuals. Locke is a deist. Uh, the definition that I got from someone who was a deist many years ago when I was a kid, I didn't know what it was. He said, well, think about God as a giant clockmaker, right? That he winds up the universe, gives it a nudge and it gets started and then walks away and the clock kind of then runs on its own. So Locke was a deist. He didn't buy into any particular religion or dogma, although he believed that there was a God and that God had created the universe and that God had given this capacity for reason and rationality, which is what creates government in the first place. It also buys into that concept number five in your notes, right? Uh, uh, human nature is rooted in individualism. Our nature is governed by natural laws, which are set by the creator, by God, that people tend to focus on their self-interest, they're egoistic. This is a huge assumption of our founding fathers. Uh, and at the Constitutional Convention, this is an assumption that is dominant. Uh, remember, Locke varies from Hobbes. Hobbes believes that uh, that, that people could not live in communities without government. Locke buys a little bit more into the ancient theory that people are more community-minded. Uh, they're at the center of his human nature. Uh, Locke does not believe in Hobbes' claim that people are interested only in self-survival, but he believes that they're also interested in the survival of their community. And one of the phrases that comes from Locke is one of the things that distinguishes people from other animals 
is that we have this sense of altruism and giving and that you will see people risk their lives to save other people's lives, even people they don't even know. And that uh, at least Locke claimed is unique to humanity. But at the core, and what I want you to underline or put yellow highlight on, I mean, this is something that will definitely appear as an exam question. The thing that distinguishes Locke and that makes him so important for understanding American government is that Locke claims that people have inalienable or what today we would call human rights. Life, liberty, and property, as I mentioned in the last mini lecture for Locke, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. Locke says that since we owe our lives and rights to God, our the Creator, and that all of us are mortal, to use the phrase of John Kennedy, subject to death if you read Locke, this makes us all equals. Clearly, we're not physically equal or mentally equal, but we're all equal in our humanity, in the sense that we're all children of God or the Creator. And this makes governments subject to the law rather than above it, because the purpose of the law, and again, think of Cicero. Remember that the reason that the law should govern society is it is impersonal. And in this case, Locke is kind of taking that idea when he says that governments should be subject to the law rather than above it, because the purpose of the government is to protect the inalienable or God-given rights of the people. So people create government through a social contract. As with all social contract theorists, both the governors and governed have obligations. Both have recourse if the social contract is broken. But as I mentioned in the first mini lecture, Locke's government is a republic. He wants a limited republic that has the consent of the people. The power of the government is limited because the people have inalienable rights. The government is also limited because of separation of powers and checks and balances with the legislative and executive branches being separated to prevent abuses of power. And of course, most importantly, because this is the basis of the American Revolution, is that people have the right to revolt and establish a government that honors natural rights and human rights and governments that cannot or will not protect those natural rights of the people should in fact be deposed by the people. Now this emphasis on property rights, and I believe the number, and this is off the top of my head, but I think at the time of the American Revolution in Britain, there were 187 crimes that could get you the death penalty. Um, there's one today in 31 states that can get you executed. So life has changed dramatically. But the emphasis on private property. Locke sees is it a good, uh, property is a good thing that through work and labor and property, um, people can find value. And if you go on to an upper division course, you'll learn about Locke's labor theory of value, and I won't even get into that right now. But your book talks about two prominent critics of Locke and Locke's emphasis on private property rights. For Locke, private property is a great thing. The primary purpose of government is to protect those private property rights. And of course, the two critics that are discussed in your book, and you should know both of these. I didn't write them in the notes, but you can make a little note to yourself. They're in the chapters, so uh, I feel comfortable doing that. And I, I think I will ask a question about both of these theorists. One of them is Karl Marx, who's often credited as being the father of modern communism. 
uh, your book points out that Karl Marx believes that private property should not be the foundation of civil society, as John Locke asserts. That the primary cleavage or division of societies are class conflicts. And this is not just a position of far leftist and communists. James Madison, a conservative, father of our Constitution and Federalist number 10, believed in this notion of economic determinism and that the greatest divide in societies historically has been class conflict between those who have property and those who don't. Now, in Marx's case, he's concerned with the masses who he believes are being exploited by the wealthy. James Madison's concern is the minority, the wealthy who he's afraid the masses are gonna envy and try to take their property away from them. But Locke and Marx and Madison all agree that there is an economic base or foundation that you build a political society on. For Locke, private property is a good thing. For Madison, private property is a good thing. For Karl Marx, it's an awful thing. It's the great scourge of history. And this is also true of the other theorist that your book mentions, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Your book refers to Rousseau as the last social contract theorist and really links him strongly to the French Revolution. Like Karl Marx, Rousseau is a critic of forming civil society from private property rights. Rousseau believes that private property transforms the state of nature, where people were timid and shy and benevolent, and that people, because of private property, are organized into social classes, that people are pitted against one another in a competition for private property, and that this destroys the natural goodness that is innate in human nature. In other words, people are basically good, but become corrupted by modern society and in particular, private property. Now, another critic emerges that you should know, and I'll conclude with this because I've got a little less than two minutes left in this mini lecture. But uh, look up the, uh, the little definition of modern liberals. That unlike classic liberals, modern liberals have a property with majority rule and equality. Modern liberals, people like John Stuart Mill, fear, like the ancient Greeks. This goes back to Aristotle, so it's not an original idea, but it's resurrected by John Stuart Mill. This notion that democracies degenerate into mobocracy. There's a little section on that and a little definition. So you should know classic liberals like Locke. You should know Marxists. You should know modern liberals. And you should even know traditional uh, conservatism, uh, which are definitions in the chapter. So this concludes the first three modules. You're done with many lectures for the first exam. So good for you. Uh, the first exam uh, will open on Thursday, October 1st, and will close on Sunday, October 4th. You'll have four days to take the exam. I will put approximately 75 questions into a test bank. The computer will randomly generate 50 questions. So each person's test will be a little different. Each question's worth two points. So if you get them all right, you'll get 100. A few days after you take the exam, I then will add 10 extra credit points. Have a wonderful day. If you have any questions, email me. Take care.
Bye-bye.